Hello and welcome again to another segment of Views from the Bridge. My name is Barbara Claris and I am here with my co-host. Hi, I'm Lucas Nash. And we are so pleased to bring another segment to you. We are super excited to announce our guest for this segment, Ms. Erin Broggs, of, who is the Executive Director of Open Communities Alliance. Um, Ms. Broggs, why don't you start by telling us just a little bit about yourself? Sure. I have uh, been in Connecticut for about 20 years, but I'm originally from Washington, D.C., uh, and I uh, grew up in sort of a civil rights family in Washington, D.C. My parents were in the civil rights movement. My dad ran an organization for about almost 50 years uh, dedicated to addressing issues of race and the law. Uh, and partly because of their work and commitment to issues of racial justice, my siblings and I all attended the D.C. public schools which um, was actually pretty rare for white kids. And it gave me an uh, incredible gift and opportunity to be uh, really a, a minority in um, a lot of my schooling. And I think it's an experience that all white people should <laughs> have the chance to do. Uh, and it definitely uh, gave me the opportunity to have a range of uh, friendships of, among people from all different kinds of backgrounds and um, absolutely shaped the kind of work that uh, I wanted to do in my life. And so I went from there. I actually came up to Connecticut to Wesleyan for college. I uh, went back to D.C. for law school and before that met a guy from Connecticut and uh, so we moved back here so he could start a business with his mom. And I started working at the ACLU of Connecticut, doing work on uh, representing prisoners, uh, representing people who had been abused by the police, working on free speech cases and a range of other things, but also uh, fair housing and housing segregation issues, particularly where the government was involved in fostering the segregation. I uh, went from there into private practice and uh, worked at another fair housing organization and then started Open Communities Alliance in 2013. Tell us a little bit about the work that OCA does. Sure. We are uh, working to fill what had been a, a void in the landscape of nonprofits in Connecticut. Um, we're trying to bring expertise on policy, organizing data, uh, legislative advocacy and, and legal advocacy to bear to address the fact that Connecticut is one of the most segregated states in the nation by race, ethnicity, and income, and that that segregation is having an impact on neighborhoods that have for the last several decades been predominantly communities of color and, and sort of that segregation has spurred disinvestment uh, and also limited choices for families who need uh, affordable housing who are disproportionately black and Latino households. Uh, so we're, we're trying to work on all of those issues together using a whole lot of tools. Very important work. Absolutely. Now, can you tell us how can realtors get involved and support your mission? Well, you know, as, as you know, of course, realtors are really critical to this whole issue. Um, they're they're at really at the front lines, and I think they're dealing on a daily basis with a lot of the uh, stereotypes that uh, have developed about neighborhoods and about homeowners. Uh, so dispelling those stereotypes is a really uh, important step that realtors can take. And I think part of that is something that I see going on right now is realtors educating themselves about the history of segregation, about the importance and positive role that housing that is mixed income can play in a community. Um, so I think those things are very important. I think keeping an eye out for segregating and discriminatory practices uh, is really important. I know sometimes uh, realtors are put in a tough spot when you're working with, let's say, a landlord who says, I don't want families with Section 8 or I don't want that kind of family. Um, but, you know, informing the client of the legal obligations, uh, if, if there's simply a, an agreement for, from all realtors that that's what they're going to do, um, then you don't lose out on a client because the clients will stop doing that because then they won't have a realtor. 
Um, so I think that's the kind of role that realtors can play. And, um, you know, we are always looking for partners to help families who have subsidies from the government, like the Housing Choice Voucher Program, um, access communities that they're interested in. So lots of families want to stay exactly where they are, and most voucher holders are in uh, higher poverty areas, but lots of voucher holders also want wider choices. And, you know, realtors could engage in that conversation with landlords who are looking for renters. And um, it actually can end up being a win-win because voucher holders are longtime tenants. They're reliable tenants because most of their rent is, is often paid by the government. Uh, and lots of uh, landlords have found that it's a, it's a great investment. It's a way to do well and do good at the same time. Right. Well, I'm, um, I'm glad you mentioned stereotypes. Um, I know Open Communities Alliance is on uh, the forefront of expanding um, zoning regulations in the state, particularly uh, with regards to multifamily housing. Um, what are some of the uh, wildest myths you've heard about multifamily housing and how would you dispel those myths? Sure. Um, you know, I think the things we hear all the time is, uh, you know, multifamily housing will bring lots of children and overrun your schools. And there's sort of two responses to that. One is, well, there are children in our state and they do have to go to school and every town should be hosting a percentage of the kids, including low income kids who need to go to school. I think that is probably the biggest point. Um, but in reality, the sort of secondary point is that multifamily housing uh, never brings as many uh, school aged children as everyone seems to think. Um, so, you know, I think that's part of the myth. I think the one that may matter the most to realtors is that um, affordable housing or subsidized housing will depress property values. And where that comes from is really the history of the way we have done subsidized and affordable housing in this country, where we have concentrated it again and again and again, year after year in the same neighborhoods. And frequently those are neighborhoods that were already struggling. And then you have increased poverty concentration. And that is what then turns into something that creates challenges for property values. If you have mixed income housing in a neighborhood that is otherwise thriving, it does not bring down property values. Um, and, and that's, I think that this notion of the difference between when the government intentionally makes decisions that concentrate poverty and when we are in a um, you know, sort of balanced way placing affordable and subsidized housing throughout regions, um, like those are really different propositions. And I think that's part of the focus. From expanding the zoning, um, what would you say is one of the most notable successes that you guys have had to date? Well, we uh, had the opportunity to challenge the Trump administration over a uh, policy that rolled back civil rights for voucher holders. Um, I don't wanna get into all the weeds, but uh, the way that vouchers work is the government sets their value and they set the value on a, for most places on a regional basis. But of course we know that a two bedroom in Hartford is not priced the same as a two bedroom in Simsbury. So the fact that the voucher would be worth the same in both places makes no sense and drives segregation. Um, so during the Obama administration, uh, a, a bunch of policymakers got together. They said, we need to do this differently. We need to look more at the local housing market to set the value of the voucher. And they created a pilot program that was gonna be pilot, piloted in, in Connecticut and a number of other places. Well, the Trump administration came along and just axed it. They, they said, we're stopping this, even though it's a regulation, which means it's basically a law. Uh, and so with the help of some great civil rights lawyers, uh, like lawyers at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and a number of other places, uh, we brought a legal challenge to the Trump administration's effort to roll back that civil rights uh, addition to the um, voucher uh, program and we won. Um, so what this has meant is that families with vouchers all across the Hartford region, and that's really the whole core of the middle of the state, have a value for their vouchers that is much more in line with the actual housing market in, in the place they want to live. Wow, that's awesome. Because as you know, as realtors out there, like we said, 
you know, it's just not the same. If you're working from, you know, Hartford County versus another county, sometimes people have those vouchers and they're stuck on that dollar limit and you can't find them anything in the, you know, areas that they're desired to live. So congratulations. That's definitely a major, major accomplishment. There's more to be done. It's not enough. There's more to be done, but it was a good first step. Erin, tell us, what does the Open Community Alliance have in store for the future? So the the thing that we are most excited about uh, that's upcoming is a campaign that we are launching to bring fair share planning and zoning to Connecticut. So as you know, Connecticut has some of the most exclusionary zoning policies in the state. Uh, We just put out a report called Zoning for Equity, which highlights some practices that are of real concern in about 12 towns around the state. Uh, And because of what we found and because of what we know about the state as a whole, uh, we are proposing that the state change the way it approaches planning and zoning. And instead of having each town do its own plans with um, really no targets, Uh, that instead we do what New Jersey does and has done successfully. Uh, Estimate the number of affordable housing units needed in each region, allocate them out to every town in that region in a fair way, and then ask each town to plan and zone for additional units so that we can meet the need in our state. And the need is astronomical. And I'm sure you see this in the real estate market, but uh, our estimate, and this is based on a report that uh, we commissioned from a a really impressive planning expert out of Princeton University, the need is 135,000 affordable units that this state needs over the next 10 years. Um, If we do this right, it's going to mean billions, that's billions with a B, of dollars of increased uh, uh, activity, uh, economic economic activity, increased uh, tax revenue for the state. Uh, it's going to be a huge economic boon for thousands and thousands of families. It will also be a really important stepping stone for you know that housing can be rental or um, home ownership. Uh, lots of it should be rental, and that affordable rental housing can be the necessary stepping stone to help so many families then reach home ownership if that's their goal. And so to do this, we're looking for partners. We're looking for partners in towns all across the state, and we're looking for partners among organizations all across the state um, to really form a consortium and push for this uh, policy in the legislative session that's upcoming. Well, we hope to partner with you on this or lend our support in any way that we can. That would be Um, fantastic. Yeah, not only a moral imperative, but good for the economy too. (laughs) Exactly. Thank you, Erin, so much for joining us. It was a a pleasure to have you. It was great to be here. Keep up all your good work. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been another segment of Views from the Bridge. Uh, questions or comments, uh, do not hesitate to email us at ghar at ghronline.com, subject views from the bridge. Take care. This segment is brought to you by our sponsor, Madhu Rendu Chintala of Freedom Mortgage. <laughs>